Thank you. Um, so welcome. Um, so yeah, I mean, tonight I was I was trying to write the speech for preparing and usually I just like it just flows out of me and I have it planned and today it was just I just I couldn't I don't know I I, I feel like I've been thinking about, you know, like Sunday was the first day of summer and um, it already kind of feels like dog days of summer in a way to me. Um, maybe it feels a little different to our soccer fans out there, but to me, I've been kind of struggling to find my footing after COVID and I'm scared about losing power again. And I'm worried about more bullshit from the Texas legislature and, you know, the list goes on and I really need some inspiration and I need change and I need something. Um, and so lately I've been thinking a lot about the phrase, the cause of labor is the hope of the world. Um, and I've been, I've been taking a Jane McAlevey course on labor organizing, and I've really been struck by how we know the formula for winning power. It's not quick or easy, um, but it works over and over again, all over the world. If we practice and learn from each other, we can learn these steps that we know work. Um, you know, if we follow these steps, we can organize workers. And if we organize workers and build up their confidence through structure tests, we build solidarity and we build power. And if we build up that solidarity and power, we win demands that really change people's lives. Um, and no matter what happens in Texas or the country, we know that the working class is the only group of people with the power in numbers and interest to win power and sustainably improve the lives of the working class. So therefore as socialists, we know that the single most important thing that we can do to improve the lives of the working class is, and to improve our own lives is to learn how to organize. Um, you can do it, everyone on this call can do it. Um, it's a muscle you build, it's a skill you train at. Um, so tonight we'll check in on how organic labor leaders win elections, how organizers are unionizing around town, how we're fighting to reform and improve unions so that they're not just focused on growing but actually fighting for workers' rights. Um, and the, the real right needs of workers every day and how we'll build community and build our DSA chapter so we can grow along with labor in this town and build some power. Um, so before we get started, I want you all to mark your calendars for the upcoming big ass labor party on July 24th, it's a Saturday. We're not sure where we'll have it yet, but um, if so, if you have ideas, um, let me know. We're, we're leaning towards some of our favorite bars around town, but <clears throat> let me know. Um, and this party will be for everyone who's in a union, who's curious about joining a union, and who's curious about joining DSA. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the mic over to our first speaker. Um, Juan, are you there? Hi everyone, yeah, I'm here. Welcome. Thank you, thank you everyone so much for hosting me. Um, like um, Leah said earlier, I was one of the delegates with the DSA delegation to observe the Peruvian elections and I have a really short presentation. It won't go for more than five to eight minutes and then I'm just gonna open it up to for Q and A's. Um, one second. Um, can you all see my screen? Good, okay, great. Um, I'm just gonna tell you really briefly um, who I am. So my name is Juan Honchong, I use he, him pronouns. I was born and raised in Peru. Uh, I am Tusan and Chanka. Tusan are the Peruvians of Chinese ancestry and Chanka are, is an indigenous nation in Southern Peru. I moved to the US in 2006. I am a member of DSA in the Detroit chapter, and I am also part of the Eco-Socialist Working Group. And in my nine to five job, I'm an environmental justice organizer and policy analyst here in Michigan. Um, 
But just to give you a really quick context, so DSA sent a delegation to Peru to observe the elections and um, it was really, it was a really contested election between Keiko Fujimori and Pedro Castillo. Keiko Fujimori is the daughter of a dictator. She's run for um, the presidency three times. This is her third run. Uh, Pedro Castillo is uh, as an indigenous peasant, a school teacher. And it was the first time that he ran for, uh, for office in a party that was unknown until this year, basically. Um, so some of the work that we did in the delegation, we met with social movements and political leaders um, around Lima that represented different parts of the country. Something that we tried to observe a lot too was like how the media was portraying the two candidates. There was a lot of media bias. There's a huge like red scare style um, of media in Peru. I'll show you a few pictures in a minute. It won't, it won't be just me talking. Um, we also got to meet Pedro Castillo and learn about, learn about his platform. And we made connections with other leftist groups around the world, like Progressive International, and the party of European left. Um, but just to give you some big pictures of what we did, this is a picture that um, we took when we met with uh, Ronderos. Ronderos is a form of uh, indigenous self-management that people in the Andes do. And we met with them to just listen what the, the issues that they were dealing with and, and who they were supporting. And of course they were supporting Pedro Castillo. And we learned a lot about like the struggles of, I mean, to me, this is not new, but I think it was new to a lot of my other co-delegates that the fight in Peru is against neoliberalism, is against capitalism, but it's also against colonialism. People mentioned that the struggle is not just uh, struggle of the last 30 years with uh, Fujimori's neoliberal constitution, but it's also the struggle of um, colonialism that started 500 years ago. Another group of people that we met here is the lawyers for democracy who were also supporting Pedro Castillo. They are trying to find ways to basically rewrite uh, the constitution. The constitution currently in Peru is um, it was rewritten by a dictatorship, by Fujimori's dictatorship in 1993. And it basically privatized a lot of uh, social services and a lot of what were, what used to be rights in the constitution. Um, I have a picture here of a transgender activist. And this was, uh, I think, a, a very controversial issue that the media uh, tried to portray in Peru and abroad to like whose party was actually supporting LGBTQ rights and women's rights. Um, there was this like really racist assumption that because Castillo was from a rural area that he was opposed to uh, women's rights and LGBT rights. Um, here is a picture of how the media was portraying the race. Th um, basically 80% of all media outlets in Peru are owned by one single group of people. It's called El Comercio Group and they were in favor of Fujimori, of course. So like the, 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 the whole media portrayal of the race was extremely biased. Um, here I have a picture of what a, vote, a polling location looks like. This is a high school. And uh, most polling locations in Peru are um, either schools or just uh, public, uh, public buildings. And you can just see people kind of like forming a line. There, there were a lot of uh, COVID measures, like people had to wear like two masks and they checked their temperature. I don't think you can see the people checking their temperatures in the picture, but, but they did. Um, something else that I want to bring up too is that um, Peru right now, the, the right wing in Peru is going through a huge um, transformation. It's becoming more radicalized in the sense that uh, they're now waving uh, an imperialist Spanish flag basically um, to counter kind of like the indigenous movement that is uh, growing in Peru. 
And if you see in the bag, you see something that says no al comunismo, no to communism. That was a huge message that the right, the, a lot of right wing political parties were, were using against Pedro Castillo. And this is the last uh, slide and then I'll open it up to Q and A's, to Q and A. Um, basically the, race, the, the state of the race right now is that Pedro Castillo won by 40,000 votes, but Keiko Fujimori is not, um, she's trying to fight and claim that there was fraud. So a lot of uh, social movements and political organizations on the left have been, um, you know, peacefully protesting uh, basically calling it a coup d'etat because that's what it is. Uh, Keiko Fujimori is really trying to, to steal the elections. Um, this was very brief and, and super quick, but I'm just going to open it up now to any questions that you might have. Awesome, thanks. If folks want to get on stack, if you have any questions, we usually have a slightly shy group here for questions for speakers. Um, but if anyone was following along in Peru, um, Sarah. Hey. Hey, uh, sorry. The, this is Sarah Swallow. I've been to Peru a few times, so this is really interesting to me. That flag that you said was an imperial flag, it looked like a red X on a white background. That's something I've never seen before. Can you speak more to that? And also, if you had any like really interesting conversations with people who live there that really showed like how they feel about Fujimori and Castillo, do you want to share any of those? Because it's interesting to hear like, because I, I assume that like, you know, people in the opposite camps don't like each other or don't like the candidate that they're voting against. But I'm curious, like what that really looks like. Yeah, so so that flag is the imperial Spanish flag um, that was used during the conquest of the Americas. Um, so I think um, it, it's a really complicated subject, right? Because I think um, a lot of people in Peru do identify with some sort of Spanish heritage. A lot of people also don't, and they identify with their indigenous heritage too. So. Um, yeah, it's becoming really, really polarized. And on the on the other side, there was the Wilpala. I don't know if you all know that flag. Um, a lot of indigenous movements use it. It's uh, it's kind of like a rainbow flag with lots of little squares of different colors. Um, anyways, um, that's the story behind that. And and it's it's kind of scary because a lot of a lot of fascist movements in Latin America and in Spain are using that flag. In Spain, it's actually banned. It's, it's considered a symbol of hate. Um, and your other question, Sarah, was about, I think, what um, everyday people were saying about Fujimori and Castillo. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, like, you know, like we know what people liberals have been saying about Trump, you know, but like, I'm curious, you know, how, like, what's the degree of like hatred or disgust or like, you know, are they making baseless accusations against each other? What does that look, discourse look like? Yeah, the, the discourse, um, I think it was really dominated by media. Basically, when we got to Lima, the first thing that we saw were like this huge like billboards saying like uh you know protect democracy don't vote for communism also equating communism with terrorism that's a huge thing in peru and yeah they will they were all over the place and it was interesting when i talked to a lot of the cab drivers that were driving us around the city um some of them knew it was just false information. They were like, they've done this before. In 2016, they did the same thing. You know, they, they said that the leftist candidate was a communist and that he specifically was a terrorist. So a lot of people this time around were like, well, that's totally false. They just keep saying that every time. Um, however, there were a few people that actually did believe that. Yeah, I remember one, one particular cab driver who who actually, um, for some reason, he associated it a lot with, uh, I guess, like religion. 
Um, yeah, and he was very much against like communism. Salvador? Hey, yes. Um, I was wondering if you could speak at all. Um, obviously, we're really um, excited by the news of, of the coalition that was built out to help elect um, this candidate. We're, I was wondering if y'all had any insights on specific, uh, maybe any organizing innovations or techniques that you feel could uh, translate or just be generally applied anywhere, um, exciting things or anything along those lines that you saw, or if this was something that had already happened um, kind of prior to your engagement or outside of uh, your engagement. That's an excellent question. I think there are a lot of lessons for um, organizing in the US from what just happened in Peru. Uh, particularly what comes to mind is uh, leftist unity. And I think that um, that subject can be a little bit controversial. In Peru, it definitely was. Um, there is a lot of room in the left in Peru to disagree. And in previous years, what that, what that um, what, what ended up happening was that you had lots of smaller leftist parties that had some sort of disagreement and then they ended up splitting the vote. Um, what I think made Castillo really successful this time around is that he sat down with uh, the other two big leftist parties, Nuevo Peru and Frente Amplio. And there are to me, there, there are some ideological disagreements. Um, I'm just gonna be clear about it. I think that Castillo, for example, he doesn't have a very explicit, um, an explicit uh, LGBTQ plus and women's rights platform. It doesn't mean that he's against it. It's just his platform is not centering that. Uh, his platform was centering more um, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, on the other hand, Nuevo Peru had a really strong um, LGBTQ rights and women's rights. And after the first round of elections, people weren't sure if the two parties were going to come together, but they did. And that was really powerful. And I think that they actually learn from each other because Nuevo Peru um, is a leftist party, but it's a little bit more technocratic. A lot of people are more uh, middle-class or upper middle-class. Um, they are like mostly uh, white Peruvians or mestizo Peruvians. So it was good that the two came together despite their disagreements and they, they won, which is great. Thanks. Um, next we have Joshua. Uh, he covered most of what I was gonna ask all time. Thanks. Uh, ben. I was wondering, uh, first, uh, Juan, thank you. Um, really enjoy it. But uh, I was wondering, did they have any message that they want to send back to us? Was there an ask? Were they saying, this is something I want you to bring up with your elected representatives or with other people in the, you know, here we are in the heart of the empire and we kind of have that burden as, you know, the left to uh, try and push against that. Yeah, I would say that right now, the biggest ask is to um, basically give Pedro Castillo legitimacy. He is, like I said, a rural school teacher, an indigenous person. Um, a lot of the political establishment in Peru is not going to easily give him the power that people that elected him is trying to give him. So I... I would encourage everyone to do as much as you can. Call your uh, representatives in Congress and the Senate and ask them to basically support democracy in Peru. People elected Pedro Castillo and, and he needs to be president. Great question. Um, <clears throat> all right, we're about to run out of time. So I'm gonna ask Chris and Bennett to ask their questions together and you can take those two together. Um, Chris, can you go first? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was, um, I was wondering, so what kind of support did, like, did you get from DSA, uh, while you were doing this? And also, how can chapters, uh, give, like, more solidarity and support in the future, 
uh, with, with, you know, when we're doing internationalist, um, like organizing. Thanks. And then Bennett. All right. I'll just have you answer Chris's question then. Thanks. Oh, oh. there you are. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, Jordan. Hi. So um, we're all together here in a big meeting. I think you're we're muted. Having a good yeah. time. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, I know that people have been talking a lot about how Castillo is, uh, you know, more socially conservative, as is most of Peru, um, but also how he won a lot of critical support from organizations that were, say, LGBT organizations or trans organizations. Or So could you explain to us a little bit about how that happened and, and sort of how those movements engaged with him um, to, you know, maybe extract some concession for their support or, or whatnot and how we can use that to relate, you know, if um, for us, at least in the US, you know, obviously solidarity, but also engaging with the fact that um, that Castillo is perhaps conservative and, and how we go about that in a constructive way. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to start with Bennett's question because I think it's, it's really important to talk about that. Um, Castillo is a bit more socially conservative, mm -hmm. but the lens that we apply to say that is coming from a more, um, what I would say in Peru would be like the urban urban um, middle class um, life. Um, I think that Castillo is actually very much for um, LGBTQ rights and women's rights from a perspective of, um, of indigenous sovereignty, basically. I think that when we talk about um, women's rights and LGBTQ rights, we have to accept that they look differently for different cultures. And I think that in Peru, there's a big gap between people that live in urban areas and people that live in rural areas. Um, so I'm really thankful to Nuevo Peru, the, the progressive party in Peru that actually made those connections uh, and, and it made it happen. Um, I think that the other thing that played in Castillo's favor too is that Keiko is definitely not a progressive in any sense of the word, not even like socially liberal. She's just extremely conservative, um, has fought um, LGBTQ rights, has fought abortion. So um, it only made sense that um, social movements went to Castillo. And I'm really also glad that he was open to speaking to them and understanding their, their asks. And the first question from Chris was about what kind of support I got from DSA. Um, well, DSA paid my flight and my hotel, which I'm really thankful for. That would have, uh, if the trip would have not been possible without that. Um, I think that in the future, um, something that other chapters can do is just help us uh, spread awareness while the delegation is in Peru. So like when we, we tried to use social media as much as we could. So it, it would have been helpful to also get other chapters kind of like retweeting our stuff. Because I think that it, it's very important that you get information from our delegation and not just what gets filtered through traditional media in the US. Thank you. Thank you all so much for hosting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. This was very exciting. Um, all right, next up we have Crystal with an update from the Restaurant Organizing Project here in Austin. And also I wanna encourage everyone to turn on your cameras if you can, because we love seeing your faces. Hey everyone, um, so I'm just going to quickly let you guys know about some things we have upcoming. Um, for those that don't know, Restaurant Organizing Project is a committee of the DSA. It's from the National Labor uh, Branch and we're all over America. We have a chapter in San Antonio now, which is very exciting. Um, but basically we're here to advocate for restaurant worker rights. We have been abused for decades. Uh, we are not fortunate enough to have a lot of unions in our industry. So we're really starting from the ground floor and we're trying to educate workers, trying to support them, you know, when they are dealing with wage theft or abuse or disrespect. Uh, and, you know, we're here for all that. So our group is not just for restaurant workers. We are for fans of restaurant workers. If you're interested in 
like helping us with this mission. It doesn't matter if you've ever worked in the industry. Um, we still can use your help as someone who dines in restaurants. So one thing we have coming up this Sunday that we would really love to have everyone attend, I'm putting the link in the chat right now, is we're having our very first in-person hangout. Um, our project has been around for about a year, so we just want to celebrate some of the things we've done, some of the actions we've done. Yeah, come party with us. Uh, we want you to bring restaurant workers. We want you to bring your unemployed friends who might be interested in working in the service industry. Because one thing that we're really heavily looking for right now are folks that want to enter the industry with the purpose of forming unions on their shop floor. Um, and we have hot shops we can put them in. So that's something that if you have some friends that may be interested in learning more about salting restaurants in Austin, we would love for you to bring them down or put them in touch with us so we can chat to them about that. Um, if you yourself would like to do that, come talk to one of us and we can definitely help out. And a couple of other things we do have coming up and they're going to be just linked in the agenda is our national body has a zoom call that's going to be a sexual harassment bystander training. So that's something that has been asked for from a lot of restaurant workers and we're really excited that that's coming together. And then the next meeting I'm about to jump on to is our next thing that we're going to be sponsoring co sponsoring is RP uh, and hopefully is the DSA as well. Um, we're doing, going to be participating in the Medicare for all rally this July. So that's something that in the next probably meeting, we will talk to you guys a little bit more about, but like for the service industry, having access to healthcare is just, it would be a game changer. Um, we have a lot of industry folks that passed away during COVID, have long-term health conditions because of COVID uh, and the other exposures we get in our industry. So we really like want to be fighting for things like that as well. So yeah, come hang out with us on Sunday. We're going to be having more in-person meetings. Follow our Instagram, join our next meeting, and I hope to see you on Sunday. Bye guys. Thanks, Crystal. Um, all right. I'm very excited to introduce next we have Joshua to talk about the intro to union series and some union stuff in general. Can I talk you into letting me share a screen? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, uh, there we go. Okay, does that look right? Okay. So for the last four weeks, well, not last week, but the four weeks before that, uh, Red Square was displaced for a series of uh, lectures and discussions on intro to labor. So the first week was just a broad introduction, the purpose of unions, the state of the union movement, which of course is pretty bad, you know, union density, strikes, workers and unions, pick a metric, they've all dropped precipitously since the 1970s. We talked about right to work laws and what they mean, what unions do, recognition, contracts, representation, et cetera, and some internal union structure. Uh, the second week was private sector, uh, introduction to labor law, and discussions with Chris from the Restaurant Organizing Project, Matt from the Emergency Workers Organizing Committee, and Paul from the IBEW, uh, with some particularly uh, critical comments that Crystal made also the discussion I should add about that. Um, week three, public sector, Again, a section on labor law, conversations with Trish and Ben from uh, Ask Me and DSA, of course, from the city and county respectively, and Amanda and Greg with TSCU, uh, which represent state workers. The last week sort of pulled it all together into a strategy session. We talked about the history of leftists and labor strategy going back to uh, the Socialist Party and the IWW at the beginning of the last century the Communist Party through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and you know such. Uh, and then the impact of in the, in the next major labor upsurge in the 60s and 70s, which was more uh, rank and file driven uh, through the impact in uh, the involvement of the Maoists and the third camp socialists, Trotskyists and whatnot. And we talked about the rank and file strategy, what it is, what it's not, and ended with a discussion of Austin DSA strategic focus. So, let's see. There we go. So, socialists focus on unions because they're the most socially integrated organization in American life. It's where we come face to face with capital 
because capitalism at its core is a system of social control based on the imposition and exploitation of labor. That's where we meet it face to face. And it's the best environment for education and organization and struggle to bring people into class consciousness. Uh, it's not a whole lot of things. It's not about the officers and the staff. Uh, that, and that's not to say we don't want good officers and staff. They certainly facilitate things. But the union is the members is not just a nice slogan. It is actually true. That's where the power is. It's not about our favorite other uh, campaigns. It's not about Medicare for all or Green New Deal or passing resolutions. Uh, as Leah said earlier, it's not quick or easy. Uh, it's also not pure. You're going to meet a lot of people in the labor struggle who have pretty dubious ideas about race or gender or sexuality and probably don't care what your pronouns are. Uh, that's We have to just kind of get used to it. You meet people where they are, not where you wish they were. And it's not DSA's working class army. Uh, Jake did a great job talking about Eugene Debs and the Socialist Party. I think that was last week. And one of the things he talked about that Debs pushed was the importance of both the party and the unions. And that doesn't mean that the party is over the unions or the unions are subservient to the party. There are two pieces and the union movement is an independent movement. So uh, I, I talked maybe too much about what it's not. The rank and file strategy pulls on the tradition called you know, trans transitional politics or transitional demands, which is kind of the idea of putting demands out there that aren't obviously revolutionary but have a strong ability to lead people to a greater understanding of capital and towards a real class consciousness. And pieces of this are building democracy and militancy and participation in the unions, developing cross-platform organizations and organization to help people recognize that it's not just about my workplace or my company or even my industry, that I have interests with the working class in general, ties to class uh, to community-based class organizations like Workers' Defense Project is, is the best example in Austin, I think. And eventually developing a point where we do reach across borders, like Juan was saying, and recognizing that it's not just my country, that capital is international. And if we're not, they're going to keep hammering us by going somewhere else where workers aren't as tightly organized. Ultimately, this all leads to an ability to begin to talk about class-based politics and build socialist organization in the workplace. A question I asked uh, a couple of weeks ago was how do we get to Minneapolis? By which I mean, in a state like Minnesota was in the 20s and early 30s, which looked a lot like Texas does now. Unions were very weak. It was essentially a boss's paradise. And over the 20s and 30s, the Teamsters Union particularly under the leadership of socialists, it's worth noting, uh, mostly uh, Trotskyist types in an outfit called the Communist League. I'm not going to go into that right now. Set out on a massive organizing drive and basically got everybody in the trucking and logistics industry into the Teamsters Union and led a series of strikes culminating in a general strike that eventually fundamentally changed not just Minnesota, not just Minneapolis, but the whole state. And it's a far more labor friendly state than it was. And it's because of that struggle. Yes, things have been lost since 1934. There have not been any general strikes there since, unfortunately. But it did change the nature of the state. And they're starting, when, when Dobbs and the Dunn brothers and the rest of those guys were starting, they're starting from where we are. Uh, if you'd like a more modern example, take the West Virginia teachers whose labor laws are just like ours and yet struck and shut down the education system a few years ago. So those are kind of the outside pieces, the, the, in some ways, the easy pieces. Nothing's easy about this, obviously. But the sort of rank and file theory, and here's a general strike where we seized power, the middle part's the hard part, which is connecting them. So the rank and file strategy brings some suggestions. Uh, and all of these that you see that are don't things are things, mistakes that I made. So I encourage you not to make them. Don't focus on union offices. As I'm going to go back to the slide because I didn't uh, actually state the quote. Farrell Dobbs, one of the most famous things he said, uh, is that we organize the base, we organize the workers. So you aim the workers' fire straight at the employers and catch the union bureaucrats in the middle. Meaning, we're not just interested in the offices. That's not the important thing. 
don't be arrogant. You don't have all the answers. In fact, your coworkers have more of them than you do. Just because we're socialists doesn't mean we know everything and we need to come in with a high level of humility. Keep the focus on the employer. <laughs> Make the union a school. Unions are a school of revolution at their best. They're there to teach workers how to fight capital, not just how to fight their boss, but that's the first step to drawing people into these transitional demands that help create a more class conscious working class. What does it mean for Austin DSA? Our number one priority should be getting into union jobs and getting our members into union jobs. How do we do that? An easy first step is job boards. Start, we should start building lists of where union jobs are. Our IBEW uh, comrades have done a great job, but there are other places. The post office has been hiring like mad lately, both for the delivery letter carriers, that's the NLC, and, the NALC uh, and the APWU, which represents everybody you've ever seen inside a post office. ATU has two local contracts, the main city contract and the UT shuttle contract, depending on which kind of job you like. There's a lot of turnover there, easy to walk into. You can get a Teamster job most of the time. That uh, Carl's gonna talk about this in a little bit, I think, but there's pretty high turnover. You can get a job as a package car, uh, packing, uh, loading packages in a car pretty much any time you want. Uh, the next list here, I, I labeled it secondary only because it's a little harder on the front end. There's no healthcare unions in Austin, but there probably will be soon, especially if you're thinking about nursing, go for it. The public sector doesn't have bargaining rights here in Texas, but neither did it uh, in North uh, uh, West Virginia. So uh, as our friend Ben is gonna tell us in a bit, it's pretty easy to get jobs and ask me or TSEU a little bit harder in Education Austin, but not much harder. And of course we're short union jobs in general because we're short uh, union density here. And so our, our comrades in ROP and EWOC are working to organize folks who aren't yet organized. And we should be pushing hard on our unions to be doing that same kind of work. Once we're in the job, we create job circles. It's pretty stressful when you first start, you don't know what you're doing, and that's a way to build support for new workers in the field and eventually building those cross union ties, which is where people begin to really recognize that this is a far deeper struggle than their workplace and begin to develop that real class consciousness that we need to build socialist organization. Over. <laughs> All right, thanks, Joshua. That was great. Um, are you able to stop sharing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I do I have to stop that? Where is that? Uh, stop. There we go. Sorry. Awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah. There's there's a lot of great discussion going on in the in the chat, and um, I think also um, I want to plug that we will hang out afterwards after the general body meeting is over for uh, discussion. So it'd be great to discuss some of this stuff there. Um, okay, so next up we have Paul Steiner, who's one of our uh, labor branch chairs, and he's going to talk about that and his job in IBW and other stuff. Hi, can everybody hear me? Cool. Yeah. Uh, hey, y'all. Uh, I'm Paul Steiner. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm a rank and file electrician in the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And also I'm a member of DSA. Uh, you know, I run, I run with, uh, along with Matt Dragomanovich, I run the labor branch here in Austin. So the labor movement has always been about one thing, solidarity with your fellow workers. When the workers are combined, nothing can stop them. And, uh, you know, we know that this, the organized working class, is the force in society that has the power to change uh, our conditions under capitalism and, you know, make the world a better place for everybody. So solidarity can come in little pieces and it can come in big chunks. You know, it can be... Uh, it can be one member looking out for another member who's having a tough time. It can be, you know, uh, having a conversation by with uh, someone about how to, you know, how to stop putting up with a foreman's bullshit on the job. Uh, or it could even be, you know, uh, bringing out tacos to a picket line and walking uh, the picket line with strangers that you've never met. Uh, what's important 
is that the rising workers movement in this country is a tide that is lifting all boats. Uh, you know, while the employing class would seek to buy, divide us based on, uh, you know, gender, race, or even trade, uh, our movement must necessarily be a diverse and large one. Uh, when class struggle is in the air, these uh, differences become less differences and more strengths, you know. Uh, and we are entering a period of unprecedented employer offensive uh, in the coming years. Uh, anyone who's working in a restaurant, a construction site, or a factory could tell you that the raw cost of goods is increasing by the day. And uh, the employing class, the capitalists, uh, are not going to say, we will share some of the pain uh, and you know, share some of the gain later on. Uh, so necessarily the quote unquote savings and uh, you know, making the bottom line run will have to come from the workers themselves. And so that will mean pay cuts, uh, you know, uh, these, temp these raises that uh, you know, people are temporarily getting. Uh, that's not in a contract, you know, but they can take that pay rate away from you at any time. And so the question is, what defense do workers have? Uh, the only thing we have is unions and, uh, you know, and our numbers. So that's why it's important, you know, uh, not to get, you know, we can't, we can't flinch at the prospect of uh, defeat or we can't be discouraged by it either. Uh, these losses that we're seeing, for example, in uh, Alabama at the Amazon uh, distributorship can only be temporary. The last ember of socialism cannot die so long as the wage system remains intact. Where workers fight and organize anywhere the class struggle takes root, so long as someone is giving their labor to someone else for pennies on the dollar, uh, the workers' movement in this country is not defeated. Uh, in the coming months and years, uh, we're going to have to be prepared to fight for our rights fight for your neighbor's rights, for a stranger's rights even. So long as we continue increasing the organization of the working class, uh, defeat can only be temporary, a prelude to the inevitable victory of the working class and uh, the rise of the Republic of Labor. Uh, time is short, you know, and it's hard to know when you're in the middle of, uh, when you're in the middle of something truly, when you're in the middle of something truly historic, and you know, I'm not going to promise to you that we're in that we're in position of anything of anything important happening, but you know, all we can do is act on the idea that what we are doing is one of the most important things and one of the most important causes that we could possibly stand for. And you know, maybe sometime when we're all old and gray. Uh, you know, we'll look back and you'll we'll think, you know, wasn't that a time, a time to free the soul of man? So naturally, you know, the, the question is, uh, if you want to be a part of the labor movement, or if you are a union member, or are simply wondering how to help out with DSA, uh, I encourage all of you to attend this month's labor branch meeting uh, next Monday, the 28th at 7 p.m. We'll be talking about how to aid workers on strike in Beaumont. Uh, just recently, the Amalgamated Transit Union authorized a strike down there in, uh, in Right to Work, Texas. And, uh, you know, and there's also steel workers locked out of their job on, uh, in, uh, what do you call it, in, at the Exxon Mobil refineries. Oh uh, so if you are looking to, for example, like Josh was mentioning, get a union job as well, you know, uh, we're going to be talking about how to do uh, expand our rank and file union presence here in Austin. And finally, we're also going to be talking about how, uh, you know, uh, along with kind of in the vein of uh, what Crystal was talking with, uh, uh, talking about with uh, the uh, restaurant organizing prog uh, project, we're also going to talk about how to reach out to unorganized workers and, uh, you know, bring them and bring potentially the whole working class of Austin into the class struggle. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice little aphorism that I like to say, which is that, uh, which I've stolen from uh, DSA city, city Council member Greg Kassar, which is that uh, Texas is not a red state. 
what it is is an un unorganized state. And, uh, you know, that's, we saw that, uh, like, like uh, what uh, Josh Fries mentioned in Minneapolis, you know, that's the kind of thing that uh, can change the course of a state forever. And, uh, you know, we, our task is to organize the working class and build it into a fighting organization that can finally win socialism. So uh, thank you all. Thanks, Paul. Right on. Um, all right. Now I'm very excited about our next special guest, uh, Carl, who's going to tell us a little bit about the Teamsters for Democratic Union. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Carl. I'm up in Oklahoma, actually. Um, I'm, I'm just going to try and persuade as many of you as possible to um, apply to get at UPS because we need, we need far more socialists. Um, in the Teamster Union. We do have uh, the largest reform movement um, of any union in the, in the country, a national reform movement called Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Um, they've been around since the 70s. Um, right now, we have a pretty contentious election that's going to kind of determine the, the, the direction of the Teamsters Union, which is the largest, I think it's the largest union in the country. Um, they, we have a we have a variety of upcoming contract fights, a UPS um, freight, a lot of local contracts um, to get involved in. We also the we're this week actually the Teamsters are uh, are in convention, the national convention. So there's a lot of discussion going on as to the, the future of the union, what, what the plans are coming up. Um, they are talking about putting together a nationwide organizing campaign at Amazon. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of opportunities to kind of plug into that. Um, I would recommend as many, as many of you that, that can, I mean, if, if you can get a part-time job there on the, on the twilight shift or the, uh, a part, you know, part-time, I think is starting off at $15 an hour. Um, with benefits and um, so it's 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 a fairly good deal we we're we're almost at 40 bucks an hour if you can get in the other um, in the driver position so it, I mean you can make you know, make some good money while you're while you're stirring shit up and uh so anyhow I I would recommend going on ups.com and put an application in try to try to get on over there because we we really need as many mill no you don't need a cdl um uh, i would uh i would say get as, as many of you on there as possible so thanks i appreciate it all right thanks carl um yeah i'm staying tuned to all the news coming out of the teamsters conference this week it's exciting um Okay, next up, we have Ben to tell us a little bit about y'all. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Ben. I use he, him, el pronouns. And uh, I, I want to say that it's a real tough series of acts to follow. Carl got me ready to, to go join up. <laughs> um, and, and Paul, as always, got me wanting to join the IBW. Uh, but I am currently a member of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFSCME 1624. Here in Austin, in Travis County, that means uh, it's the union that organizes the city of Austin workers and the uh, Travis County uh, workers. And I work for Travis County. Uh, for me, what, what that means is, gives me a place to help spread the broader labor movement, workers movement, and it gives me a way to plug into what is going on in other unions that I'm not a member of, right? So uh, my union forms part of a central labor council. And through there, I hear about, oh, the teachers need help or, hey, the, you know, this other union needs help and I can show up to their things. Uh, but more and more, I'm hearing about it first through, through DSA. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the challenges in my union is that a lot of people see it, uh, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll see it as just insurance, you know, oh, that's who you call when you get in trouble. Uh, and while they do provide help, uh, you know, the, the 
the true value in it is recognizing that we're all laborers, we are all workers, and we have that in common. And, uh, you know, Joshua mentioned about organizing in places with people sometimes don't have the best politics. And um, that is a place where we rub shoulders with people who maybe don't agree with us on things, and we can, we can start to win them over slowly. Uh, they can see us as, oh, hey, you know, that person's a socialist, but they're not some person who wants to destroy me and, you know, my household. They want good things for me. They want me to have dignity and fair pay and safety. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe I've been told, you know, a bill of lies. Uh, so that's that's what my union means for me. Uh, it's, a, it's a chance to help other people, uh, especially the lowest paid amongst my, you know, amongst my coworkers, amongst, you know, my employer. Who's the lowest paid? How can I pull them up? Um, and uh, as far as getting a job, you go to governmentjobs.com and, and you can get any county job, any city job that you see on there that you that seems like a fit. And there's a wide variety of them. Uh, you know, I started working just in a you know, customer service role in a call center. Um, and I did that for a long time. Uh, but, you know, I moved to a different, you know, also an office job, but, you know, uh, so there's there's many ways into a good union job with, you know, good benefits. And, uh, you know, I, I would recommend it if, if you're looking for something like that. Um, as far as the the y'all portion that Leah mentioned, that's the young active labor leaders. And we're having a float this Saturday. I'm dropping the details in the chat. Check it out. Uh, come hang out with other people who are active in the labor movement uh, here uh, and, uh, you know, float on the river, uh, you know, hit hit the river. It's, it's hot out there. That's what, why my background is, uh, is this. We're not floating this river per se, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a good time. We get a good chance to hang out and, and chat and talk about what's going on in your workplace. Awesome. I'm so excited about that. Um, all right. Next up, we have a very exciting new resolution to vote on um, and debate. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Jake first, who's the um, initial author. Hey, everyone. Uh, could, would someone mind uh dropping the link to the resolution in the chat so you can take a look at it if you haven't already. Um, yeah, my, as Leah said, my name is Jake Jackson. I'm the communications coordinator on the Boston DSA leadership. And uh, the, I wrote this resolution because, you know, uh, I, 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 we've been on leadership for uh, a while now, almost six months. And, you know, it's it worth, coming out of the pandemic now but you know one of the sort of recurring issues that comes up that came up again and again throughout the past you know year and over a year is that it's been difficult for like members to get involved with the organization because there's not a sort of all encompassing campaign in the in the way that the uh, DSA for Bernie campaign and the Heidi Sloan for Congress campaign was in in 2019 and in, in the beginning of 2020. Um, and th there, you know, even when there's not a super clear way to get involved, it is still important that every member to the, you know, best of their ability is contributing to, to building to building this movement because uh, it, 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 you know, to to uh, paraphrase Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, change always comes from the bottom up, never from the top down. So if, if we are going to build a successful socialist movement in Central Texas that can, uh, you know, elect more socialists to office, uh, build our power in in the labor unions, um, and, and do all of these things that we know we need to do in order to build power for the working class then we are going to need a strong participatory movement. And uh, part and parcel of that is, is making our movement, making our chapter more representative of, of the broader working class. I think, I think everyone knows that uh, you know, DSA is, is not yet 
uh, representative of of the entire class. You know, it skews uh, whiter and and more uh, college educated than than the working classes is on average. And uh, and that's not that's not an intractable issue. Uh, it, you know, it's something that we can't overcome if we go at it consciously and and actively try to resolve it. And so that's why I drafted this resolution was uh, to essentially address these two questions. What should DSA members be doing? And what should we all be doing uh, in order to make our organization uh, a, a truly, uh, an organization that is truly rooted in the, in the working class of, of our city? And, uh, and the, the solution there is, is uh, it's it's a lot of stuff, but but the general idea is is uh, active uh, recruitment and outreach um, with with focus on a few particular uh, areas. Uh, so let me see if I can uh, rattle them off real quick. Uh, yeah, one number one is the workplace uh, coordinating more closely between all of our different workplace and labor organizing efforts. Two is. Uh, Youth outreach, uh, especially uh, at uh, ACC, um, which has a pretty diverse uh, group of people, and, and you know, uh, is is not uh, is more yeah, Austin Community College uh, is more representative of, of the broader class, and also has these like certificate programs and in nursing and welding and everything in between, um, which is I think is a great place to do recruitment from. And another thing is is uh, uh, planning uh, our own Austin DSA rallies and stuff, and also uh, building up the capacity of members to uh, to um, get signatures uh, to walk around and talk with talk with people about DSA, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the last thing is is planning more and more uh, outward facing social events um, to attract new people, which you know is is going to be more and more prevalent as as we come out of the pandemic and people are really, you know, jonesing to, to talk with someone outside of Zoom, uh, which I can certainly relate to. Uh, and, and, you know, just the first, the first, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, just the first um, few social events that we've done have already been very successful. I mean, the last happy hour we had, uh, you know, 30, 30 something people at it and, and a lot of new people. So kind of continuing that trend and, and being more conscious about outreach and recruitment. So that's the idea. All right, thanks, Jake. Um, so before we vote on this, we will hold debate. Um, so if folks can type in the chat, if you're stack for or stack against the resolution. Um, all right, Seneca. Hi, everybody. Sorry about the glare. Um, yeah, uh, I think that the, the first national um, uh, recruitment drive was um, a big success, um, and uh, it inspired a little bit of development of some training materials. Uh, I think this is a pretty good idea, uh, and I pledge that if it does pass, um, that um, we will make sure that um, both the Homes and Handcook handcuffs group uh as well uh as uh, <clears throat> as well as just myself and uh danny um who's a local trainer um are going to put together support materials on how to have recruitment conversations um and ones that are specific around uh, recruiting people that you may know from specific issue areas as well um so this is not just going to be like a pyramid scheme it'll be like actually supported um at conversations that you need to get good at anyway All right, thank you. Um, if we don't have any stack against, I might cut this off early, but um, I will go to Sarah. You're next, right? Did I miss? Yeah. Me? Okay. Um, I wanted to just comment on the fact that one of the specifics of the resolution is the goal to have 200 new members. And um, one thing I've been doing is tracking our retention and how many new members we get. And this number it would be 
200 mem new members in six months without there being like a Bernie campaign would be um, like higher than we're currently doing, but also very achievable. Um, so I think it's like a perfect goal for us. Um, so I just want to speak to that specific portion of it. All right, thank you, Sarah. And um, all right, last, I'm gonna call on Katie. Oh, I, sorry, I think my only question, and I typed it in, um, was, was is there a way for us to engage with, with this resolution while also considering folks who have maybe joined but aren't active and engaged in, in kind of the DSA membership and circle? I feel like there's a, a huge gap there of people who, you know, don't attend meetings, don't, um, aren't active, um, that could also be really beneficial in this recruitment of new members to ship to. Numbers are great, right? But I mean, also if, if they aren't coming and doing those things um, and doing the things that we, you know, desire them to do, um, then how are, you know, how are we closing that gap? Thanks, Katie. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, go ahead, Jake. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, uh, no, I think that's a great point. And that, that's why, um, I, you know, a big part of this resolution is coordinating with the membership engagement uh, committee, which is, uh, you know, I mean, Sarah Gore can talk more about this, or, or uh, if you're if you're interested in helping out with this, uh, anyone on the call, you, you should reach out to her uh, because, you know, they're doing a lot of great stuff in terms of engaging already existing membership, uh, having one-on-one uh, -on -one phone conversations with newer members, helping them to get involved, uh, doing new new member orientations. Um, all this, all this good stuff. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's definitely a crucial component of it. And, and uh, you know, I think that one of the main uh, motivations was to sort of re-engage um, people who, who've kind of uh, fallen into being less active uh, by giving them very uh, discreet uh, and, discrete tasks with a, a low barrier to entry you know so you know stuff like tabling and uh helping to organize a social event that's not super uh daunting yeah learning how to organize events and stuff is our bread and butter so i think it'll help with that um and yeah sarah is going to speak in a little bit about the membership committee so um we'll just wait for that um and so i I think that's it unless we had any stack against i didn't see any unless i'm missing any other questions or anything all right um we are now going to vote on this resolution someone has the link for the we go all right so if you are a member of austin dsa please click on the link and vote for or against this resolution. I'll give people two minutes. Once I get my timer going. Yeah, and I, just as we're waiting, for the votes to come in, I, I will just say that because people were putting stuff in the chat, if you have uh, specific thoughts, uh, feel free to reach out to me and, and we'll be having like a uh, some sort of meeting uh, soon if this if this resolution passes. So what's the best way to reach out to you, Jake? It's a good question. Uh, if you're on if you're on the slack you can do that uh i don't really care for that myself but um you know feel free i'll, I'll respond to you there uh and i just put my email in the chat too so you can shoot me an email okay well i it's the if you haven't voted yet, you should go ahead and do so. But at this point, um, 
it's a landslide, folks. 49, 49 votes for, zero against. So I think that's, I think that's, uh, that passed. I've seen enough, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, folks. Um, somebody asked how to become a member of Austin DSA. Um, First of all, the normal method is um, I posted this link in the chat. If you're if you're not yet a member of DSA, um, if you want to become a member of DSA, I think you email membership at dsausa.org to transfer. But if anyone knows better than me, okay, yes, that's it. Um, Okay, awesome, thanks. All right, so now we'll go into some uh, announcements. So first, oops, uh, Seneca is up to tell us about an update, about an exciting win, and what's up next for the defund decrim campaign. Yeah, um, so in a year where um, you authoritarian uh, regressives have been uh, hammering um, people across the state uh, on criminal justice issues, uh, we still have been organizing and still winning um, in Travis County in Austin uh, with a great deal of help from our socialist electeds uh, like Jose Garza. Um, there was a women's jail um, that the vote to build was uh, just a, a week or, or so ago, uh, and that would have taken $80 million um, to build a new jail when the current one is at less than 10% capacity, uh, money that could be spent on services, diversion, uh, and things that the working class sorely needs uh, at a time where we're still you know, recovering from pandemic. The original jail was supposed to be built in 2017, um, but a DSA member uh, and uh, organizer with grassroots leadership, um, Louis Conway Jr. Um, was the one to originally put uh, a stop to that. Uh, he was also one of the first people we ever ran for city council. Uh, and I'm proud that we uh, have been able to go further in that tradition. So um, the reason we were able to win is because of organizing that we did before. It wasn't because of the moral strength of our arguments. It wasn't because we, you know, went and found the, the secret inside of Jeff Trevelyan's head and then, you know, persuaded him and Bridget Shea. Um, what we did was to take the canvassing that we've been doing relentlessly um, since about November of last year to identify defund supporters uh, within Travis County in Austin. And then we took one of the swing voters, um, in this case, Bridget Shea, and we made an example of her. Um, so we reached out to 5,000 defund supporters in her district and told, her that, uh, told them that she was going to vote for the women's jail and to let her know how they felt about that. Um, that resulted in uh, her getting about 200 uh, emails and phone calls uh, in the span of a few days, um, and then about 150 people testifying, the vast majority of them from her district. It's important to note that we did not turn this all the way up. We did one text bank and one phone bank, and then we reached out to a few members to call in. Um, of the 5,000 we reached out to, we have about 25,000 people that we've identified. Um, and this organizing, right, identifying and solidifying um, people's opposition to using policing as a solution to the problems of the working class is an important piece of not just winning these issues, but also making sure that Jose Garza is not a one-off, that there will be Jose Garza in every judicial slot within Travis County by the end of 2028. Um, so that means we need to identify a lot more, a lot, a lot more. So what we've been doing um, is a coalition called Austin is Safer When, uh, where we go door to door, we call folks, and we tell them the police can't solve their problems. Um, I'll go ahead and put in um, the next canvas. We do a canvas every Saturday. Um, we also have our committee meetings, um, where we kind of go over our strategies every Sunday, um, which I will hopefully be able to pull up from the website uh, more quickly, like a prepared person would have done. Um, and, you know, on the point of, uh, you know, our membership drive, it's important to note that we have 25,000 defund supporters and 2,000 volunteers um, that we've identified. And every one of those people should be in Austin DSA. Only about 300 of them are right now. Um, that number can and should be a whole lot bigger uh, because a lot of people have just learned um, that the Democratic Party and a great deal of the local nonprofits are not going to do shit. Uh, when you know the poor and impoverished are under assault from regressive forces, uh, but that DSA can and will organize 
uh, against them and that we need to do a lot more in order to make sure that we keep our communities safe uh, because police won't do it, we will. And there's your other link uh, for our committee. Um, yeah, that, that's it. Let's, let's take a lot more money from the police in the future, even though they've uh, put some roadblocks in our way. Uh, and then, you know, get them out of schools too. Fuck them. I love stealing money from the police or taking our funds back. Anyway, um, thank you, Seneca. Next up, we have Sarah Gore talking about the membership committee. Hey, thank you, Seneca. And thank you, Katie, for that great question about what we're doing to engage members. Um, right now, the membership committee, which meets monthly, but we just met yesterday, so we're not going to meet again for like another month. Um, we have been focusing on how to better engage new members. Um, if you signed up sometime between, say, I don't know, um, December and, I don't know, March, whenever like the leadership committee was transitioning, um, you might have got left kind of in the lurch. You got, you know, that you get an email from Maria and National um, and then, you know, maybe sign up for a newsletter and get hooked up with a newsletter. You request to be on the Slack, you get in the Slack. So we're trying to automate some more of that stuff so that members, as soon as they join, if they're within the zip codes that are part of our chapter, um, you know, we give them a welcome from our chapter. Um, we get them more like tightly and quickly hooked into uh, the newsletter and the events calendar, morning Slack, stuff like that. But also one thing we have going on now for a second month, we're doing new member orientation. They're open, not just to new members, but any member who wants, wants to come because there's a really great um, vibe that happens whenever we are pairing like new members with uh, more tenured members in these conversations. Um, and also non-members who are curious should come and we'll talk about, you know, how to join DSA also, um, like what our goals then are with DSA um, and how to get more engaged. And so that orientation, the orientation for June will be Saturday at 2 p.m. Um, it's cool, you get to meet people, but it's also, it's also low key, like no pressure. Uh, so I highly suggest coming, um, links in the chat. Um, also, we have a social event this Friday. That'll also be another like chill way to get to meet other new members or more senior members and talk about getting involved. Come All right, thanks, Sarah. And next up, we have Tandra. Tandra, is there anything happening on Friday? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, we're going to meet at Black Star Co op on Easy One Street at 7 p.m. Um, brewery, and they have a full menu, vegan meat options and they're not al alcoholic drinks um yeah so we'll start at seven i think they close at 10 so if people want to keep partying we can walk across the street to long play on saint john and uh yeah and hopefully i can convince someone to get drunk and stand on a table and give a fiery eugene depps type speech uh so if you feel like you want to do that go for it i support you um, yeah, and so you can ride the train there and the 801 and the number one bus go over there. You can ride your bike. Just, uh, yeah, no drinking and driving. So make good decisions. So I'm not your mother and it's going to be great. Seven o'clock. Black Star. Thanks, Sandra. Um, all right. Did anyone else have any important announcements that we didn't get to upcoming events that you need to plug? going once. All right. Um, the Black Star thing is on Friday. It's Friday at 7 p.m. Um, we also, I want to plug, have a, uh, added a questions channel to Slack. So if you have any questions about how do I get involved? How does this thing work? How do I organize a happy hour in my neighborhood or a barbecue or something? Like, please reach out. The, we're all there in the questions channel to help. Saturday is the river float. Yep. All right. Um, I'm going to play some exciting music to um, end the meeting and then um, hang around if you want to have a discussion. And thank you, Serena, who will be moderating the discussion after our meeting tonight.